Hi everyone, lovely to see you all today and I'm very pleased to welcome you to Sobia. Um, Sobia is an incredibly inspiring performance coach and formerly a champion kickboxer and a teacher. Sobia, fantastic to have you here with me today. Thank you, thank you Francesca. Great, so to start with I'd love to find out what a performance coach is, uh, what inspired you to become a performance coach and what gets you up in the morning? So I, uh, a performance coach is somebody who helps people get to their desired goals, their outcomes, what's important for them. And what I do is I look at what is happening for my clients or the people that I'm working with, and I help them become more efficient and more effective so they can reach their goals and their outcomes, whether that's within their personal life or in their business. So essentially, it's referred to as performance coaching, but Coaching is improving somebody's performance, it's improving the effectiveness of them and the, the, the impact that they're creating within their life and within their working life as well. So that's what I help people to do. I help them in their life, in their personal life, in their businesses to increase their performance and their effectiveness. And what motivated me um, to become a coach, a life coach and a business coach was a journey that I started within myself on personal development. And as I started to learn more about myself and develop within myself, within my mindset, within my beliefs and my values, it was an incredibly transformational process and it changed my entire life. It really did. And as I went through that process myself, that evolution, I realized this is something that I've really connected with. And it's been so instrumental in my life that I want to help other people with this same journey, a similar journey. Um, so that's a little bit about what motivated me to. Yeah, to and I suppose that really ties in with my next question with, you know, what's your personal kind of purpose story you know in terms of how how did you get from being a teacher to then um, becoming a coach and and sort of finding your purpose with serving other people in that way my journey of teaching started right when I started when I graduated from university I graduated and I went straight into my postgraduate and then as soon as I graduated within that, I landed myself, well, I didn't land myself, but I got myself into a really good job as a, a science teacher in an outstanding science school. But I did that and it was almost like the motion of graduating and getting a job. However, throughout my teaching career, even though it's a very rewardable and con you contribute so much to people's lives, I always felt that I had a higher purpose. and uh, I dabbed and delved in lots of different other things such as charity work, such as helping organisations, but I always was searching for this higher purpose. I just didn't know what it was, Francesca. It was just really frustrating at the same time because to the outside world, it seemed like I was educated, I had a good job, I was going through you know, what society and family expect of you, you're, you're progressing. But within myself, I knew I wasn't connected to my vision, my purpose. But it sounds odd, right? That I just, I didn't even know what that was. It was just, I, was, I had this yearning within myself. And so as I went through my, my career and I, it was then personal circumstances that led me into personal development. And it was there where I thought, right, this is, this is what I've been searching for. So it wasn't just personal development. It was like I had a connection with this higher purpose that I referred to. Mm. And that's where, that's where the transition occurred. I'd before in my teaching career, I tried uh, different things. Like I said, I worked for different organizations. I tried uh, working, well, not tried, I had a senior position within a, a charity that was all very, that was all voluntary. And it was, it was great. It was great. It was really rewarding. And at that point where I thought, okay, this is, this is something I like doing. I like helping people. I like serving. Um, and then I, I also ran my own business as well as a tutor. But now as a coach, I feel I'm really aligned to what I was really created for, my higher purpose. 
Wow, that's really powerful. And um, it explains why you've had so much success because you've, you've really sort of found it and it kind of radiates from you. I, I was immediately drawn to, you know, your profile and what you stand for and everything. Uh, but having sort of achieved that, you know, and, and hit that goal of finding your, your higher purpose, how, how would you actually define it so other people also know if they're looking for that in their life? Is it a sort of an emotion or is it a state of mind? Um, is it a profession? How would you sort of define it? Truthfully, it's a combination of everything. It's a combination of being there intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. It's a combination of all those different factors. Um, it's, al it's aligning what you're doing with your passion. So it's a, it's a great mix of your profession and your passions coming together. And you, earlier on, you asked me what motivates you to get out of bed in the morning. And the reality of it is that knowing that when I have a conversation with somebody and the interaction that I'm going to have with them is going to be life changing. And that's not said in an arrogant way, Francesca. It's said in the way that the coaching space is so powerful because we go about in our daily routines and our daily lives, regardless of what professions we're in. But we don't have deep, meaningful, valuable conversations. We may with some people, but in a space where you really speak about what is holding you back or what challenges you and having those breakthroughs knowing that I'm going to have one of those conversations with somebody and it's going to lead to them changing their life is a great motivation for me. Wow, that's really very inspiring. So what advice would you have for people who are looking for their, that dream job that sort of fills their purpose? What would you say they should um, go out and, and do? Firstly, it starts with getting clarity on what they want from their life. So if anybody is listening to this podcast, the first thing I would like you to do is just think about what you want from your life. What is your vision for your life? This is not about what your parents expect of you or what you think society expects of you, but really what is your vision for your life? And then look at what's needed to create that. Do you need, um, finances what life are you wanting to lead and then you look at where you are at the moment and if there is alignment there if there's a if there are overlapping values or um, actions that you're already taking and they align with what you're wanting out of your life then you're on the right trajectory However, if where you want to be in life and what you want from your life is completely different to where you are, then growth development needs to take place. Something needs to change. And my advice to those people is that just be open. Don't be restricted because everybody is unique. One person's success is not the other person's success. Everybody's unique. However, as a society, I think we're all expected to go for the same things it's great that you graduate from university get yourself in a good job nine to five and progress the career ladder and that's defined as success but that's not really success because many people who are in those professions don't have a life that they really want they've just landed themselves and they've gone according to what people and society has expected of them but success really is about what you want from your life so what is it that you enjoy? What is your passion? What drives you? What motivates you? And it's those values and those driving factors that when you align them with your, with your vision, you're going to make so much more progress and that is more successful for you than a nine to five in a corporate job. Wow, that's really powerful. And it means that everyone's got their own individual journey and so they're not necessarily they don't have to follow scripts um, of what they're supposed to do in life and I, I definitely resonate with that I would like to ask you about uh, a, new, a news event that happened uh, recently so um, on the 25th of May um, George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis in Minnesota and it sparked a whole sort of 
Black Lives Matter revolution around the world and all sorts of protests. And there is this sense that people do feel like they are trapped within their position or there's a lot there's still a lot of prejudice whether it's towards women or um, black people or muslims ethnic groups and um you know i think it's incredible that you were a kickboxer so you know just looking at you no one would assume that but it's incredible that you can say you know don't don't judge a book by its cover you know this this Absolutely. Is some incredible things um so do you think that now is a, t a good time to sort of maybe tackle this issue of, you know, race and discrimination? Um, and have you had difficulties, you know, facing that personally, um, you know, people stereotyping you, putting you in a box, and then having to prove that, you, you know, you don't need to be in that box, you deserve to be out of the box in a sort of, and defining yourself in a different way? So I'll deal with the first part of that question, which you spoke about race and discrimination and whether now is the time to speak about it. Mm. Taking into account the world affairs and people voicing their concerns and standing up against racism and discrimination. This is something that's been going on for centuries and decades. It's a sad reality, but it has existed for many, many years. And looking at what has happened within the last few weeks and possibly months with what's happened with Black Lives Matter in America, a colleague of mine and I had a really in-depth conversation about this. And racism, discrimination has existed for, as, long as we look back at history, it's been there, it's existed. But the interesting thing is now with COVID-19, and the crisis and the pandemic that's hit the whole world, there's an element of consciousness that has arisen in people who possibly would never have spoken up before. And it's interesting because it wasn't just racism, it was also tied in with the consciousness of other people, people who possibly in the past would never have spoken up. So if you're asking me from a personal perspective, anytime there is any injustice, regardless of whether it's sexual discrim discrimination, whether it's racial dis discrimination, any sort of prejudice or any sort of discrimination in my eyes is wrong. And anybody who views it should stand up against it. It's not just now, I think generally we all should. I do also understand that many people from certain backgrounds are also afraid to speak up. And these are conversations that I've had with my friends who are white. They, are, they don't know what to say. They don't know, they're, not, they're afraid to say the wrong thing. But actually, they have always felt that this discrimination has existed. It's just now it's become far more apparent. Before, it possibly was something that they just shrugged off or they were aware of, but it just wasn't part of their consciousness. As many of us go about in our lives, this is just everybody, in my opinion, we go about in our life and we have unconscious biases. They're biases that we've formed from a young age, from our family, from our friends, from the media, and they form our judgments. And these exist amongst all of us. But what's interesting now with the Black Lives Matter is many people have started to become aware. So it's gone from their unconsciousness to their consciousness and they're speaking up and it's about time because any kind of discrimination is wrong but going back to discriminating against people because of merely because of the color of their skin it's complete it's it's something that needs to be addressed yes 100 percent. thank you so much for that lovely um reply and i i agree that we all need to stand up um for ourselves and for each other um, so as a performance coach, um, you know, giving advice to individuals, whether black, black Muslim, ethnic women, uh, disabled, whatever their sort of um, hang up, you know, might be, that, and they might feel sort of um, like they're in a min minority within their organization, um, but at the same time, they're equally sort of ambitious and they want to get ahead in life. What advice 
would you have for them if they say feel imposter syndrome because there aren't many people to sort of role models to look up to or um sort of programs to help them get ahead what what advice would you give to them in that question francesca there's something you mentioned which is really important which is imposter syndrome so i'll deal with that firstly because i think it's really important to address that as a as a as a coach imposter syndrome exists in most of us, regardless of whether we're in a minority or whether we're part of a majority, whether you are an employee or you are a director of a company. I've worked with people and leaders of different backgrounds, different ethnicities, uh, different genders, and different positions within a business. And it's been interesting because imposter syndrome has existed in almost every single one of them. You would make the assumption that somebody who's a director and he's a male and he's a great leader wouldn't suffer from imposter syndrome. And just for the record, imposter syndrome is where you feel you're not good enough to do something. You feel that you're inadequate. Um, and so there is an element of negativity there within your own mindset. And I think as a population, we all give more emphasis to negativity than we do to positive thoughts. To the successes that we have so this imposter syndrome exists i think to us to some degree or another in most of us mm. so that's there just generally relating that to being in a minority whether that's in terms of being black or from a different ethnicity or um, if you're a woman or any minority if you are good at what you are doing in terms of your profession you need to recognize that because that is what you are there for is to contribute professionally and if you feel that is not good enough then that's a way of you recognizing how to improve but professionally you shouldn't be suffering from imposter syndrome because you are there by merit you're not in any position just based on your background or your sexuality or your gender. You're there based on merit. And if that is the case, remember that is the success marker for which you were employed. And so if you feel you're not good enough, that is an element of imposter syndrome that needs to be addressed. But you are there based on merit. And so never let yourself think you're not good enough because you are there for a reason and that's there for a professional reason and continue to continue to contribute, continue to work professionally, and you will be recognized for that. However, if you feel you're being discriminated against, that's a different conversation, and there are ways of addressing that. Wonderful, thank you, that's fantastic advice. Um, and very interesting to hear that everyone suffers from it in one way or another, and it's, it's a form of negativity and negative self-talk. So um, if, um, you are to sort of run a company and you're sort of speaking to, uh, I don't know, a, a founder, let's say, who, who has lots of employees or business owner. Um, how would you create or what advice would you give to them to create a more inclusive um, atmosphere? Um, and are you doing anything in that space at the moment? Okay. So if you are a leader or a founder, of a, a director or founder or you have a senior position within an organization i think it's really important to firstly become aware of your own unconscious biases i say we all have them we all are raised with a certain programming as a human being and often that's part of that unconsciousness that's part of it's subtly there in the background so becoming aware of them makes you then realize when you're actually putting them into place, because whether we like this conversation or not, but the reality of it is that people tend to employ people who look like them or are of a similar background to them. And this is done because of many reasons. But when we become conscious about our biases and when we become aware of them and we address them, it's then where we're taking action. And it's the action which enables progress. I say this to all my clients as well. You're only going to make progress if you take action on the goals and the outcomes that you set. 
applying that now to a leader or a director or a founder when you are aware of your um, biases you can then take action towards them and taking action is recognizing somebody for their merit for the value that they bring for the experiences that they have for the contribution that they bring to the team it's not merely judging them whether that's consciously or unconsciously on the way they look or on the way that on the on the color of their skin or, or their ethnicity or their appearance or their gender or their sexuality for that matter wow and um one last top uh, question on on the topic of of racism if i may but since you were a teacher and you are also a parent um i think that a, a lot of racism really stems from childhood uh, and socialization we we learn a lot of things when we're children um so what role do you think parents and schools have to play in um, fixing this sort of systemic problem that can be tackled but um could, should maybe be tackled at an earlier age parents play a fundamental role in the programming of their children racism is not something that we're born with we're, we're not born to discriminate we're not born to be racist we uh, we learn that behavior and where do we learn it from we learn it from our parents our family members our friends the media and so looking at firstly the family and then when you have children i have i have a young five-year-old i recognize that i have myself and my husband have a an, in, an integral role in raising her with the right views when we program our children and when we raise them with the right values that forms their mindset and we have and that's not entirely just the parents responsibility society plays a role in that teachers play a role in that friends the media the responsibility of the media is imperative here we do we can't discount the the responsibility that the media play in the programming of us as a society and so whether that's um whether that's subconsciously in certain messages or whether that's explicit in the way media is covered and news reports are made so going back to the role of parents and teachers it's absolutely pivotal and the way that i i suppose we can start addressing these issues is recognizing the value that we all can bring that nobody is superior based on the color of their skin or what country they come from or what ethnicity they come from. It's based on the way we carry out actions on the goodness of a person and the way they contribute, not the color of their skin, but the value that they bring. And so when there are conversations in the household taking place about certain races and certain religious backgrounds and certain genders, the parents have a real responsibility in those conversations with their children because that's where they're learning from and same in school when teachers are not taking notice of certain discrimination racism or children just mocking a child because he or she may be different to them that again is subtle but needs to be addressed wow that's really powerful and um i didn't i didn't um associate it with sort of childhood bullying but yes i think there and also the media angle um you're right they they sort of uh, repeat certain messages and you kind of become programmed which is a, a pity so the media definitely has a big role to play but um thank you so much for all your wonderful advice today i'm sorry to have started on a high and then to have delved into this really very tricky and um you know difficult subject but i would love to know from you what um if there are three things that our audience can take away from this conversation what would your advice be so just firstly francesca i want to just from my point just mention that these conversations that we're having are really important to have because we all need to recognize that we can't judge each other that these conversations need to take place 
so we can make progress as a society. Essentially, they're still there, that discrimination, racism, prejudice, it's still there. We need to have these conversations. So it is a very heavy topic. It is a topic that is full of responsibility, even as I speak about it. But I recognize it's really important to address. In terms of the first part of the conversation, which was about um, coaching, the, the way I'd like to answer this is I'll deal with the coaching and then I'll deal with this conversation that we've just had because I can't give you three takeaways on both sections of the conversation. Is that okay with you, Francesca? Yes, absolutely. That's perfect. Thank you. But with coaching, I think, and with the vision that you have in life, I think it's really important that we really ask ourselves what we want from our lives because we tend to get really engrossed in what the expectations of others are, the way we're programmed, the way we're raised, about what success looks like for us. It's really important that you look at what's important for you. The second thing that's really important is to look at where your goals and your ambitions and your vision are. Where are they? And what are you doing about them? And the third thing is, who, is, who are you accountable to? And when I say this, we are all, we all have visions and we all have goals for our lives. But a lot of people just fall by the wayside and get engrossed in life because they've got no accountability. So who is your accountability partner or who are you accountable to? Because that's why coaching is so powerful, because you've got somebody in your space who knows your strengths, who looks at your challenges and your obstacles and gives you direction using the strengths that you have to overcome them and then you have accountability somebody you're answerable to for the actions that you're taking so they're the three things i'd like people to think about in terms of coaching and accountability is so important i as a coach have three coaches myself wow yes Three coaches. Three coaches. I have a accountability coach. I have a public speaking coach and a business coach because accountability for me is so important. That is what's enabling me to progress. So people who are listening, ask yourself, who's, who are you accountable to? And if you can't think of anybody, I invite you to have a conversation with me. I offer complimentary coaching um, calls first 45 minutes to just have a, a very casual chat to see what um, your obstacles are, what your challenges are, what you're wanting to get from your life, what are your goals. So I invite you into a conversation like that because it's, it's really interesting and it's life-changing. It definitely changed my life. In relation to the race and discrimination conversation, I think it's firstly really important people start to become aware of their biases, their thoughts, because when we become aware of them, we can then take action towards them. Becoming aware, second is speaking up about them. If you are discriminated against, speak up about it. And discrimination takes form in different ways, even not being able to speak up about your grievances is a form of underlying discrimination because you feel you're not given the space to voice them so voice them go to the relevant people and voice them because they will be heard from somebody or another and the third thing that we need to understand is work if you genuinely feel you're discriminating against somebody or you feel discriminated against once you've become aware of it once you've spoken up against it, think about what actions are you going to take that are productive. So if you're discriminating or if you realise you are discriminating, what actions are you going to take towards working towards that? And if you feel discriminated against, what actions are you going to take towards that? Because that's where the progress is going to happen. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I really, really enjoyed this conversation and I've learned so much. So I think our audience will as well. Um, and um, yes, I, I wish you the best of luck for all the work you're doing in the performance coaching space. Thank you so much, Francesca. And thank you for this opportunity.